Hello, I'm Richard Atkinson, and I'm going to be reading from the first chapter of my book, Mr Atkinson's Rum Contract, which tells the story of my Georgian slave-owning ancestors and how I came to learn about their disturbing activities on the island of Jamaica. So this is the story of how I found my 18th century family. It was as though Bridget's cookbook was the key I had been searching for since doors immediately began to open. The thousands of old letters that fell into my lap as a result of my miraculous trip to Temple Salby, they were just the start. Within a few months I had located significant quantities of Atkinson correspondence in more than a dozen public archives and private collections on both sides of the Atlantic. My ancestors, it emerged, had occupied ringside seats at some of the most momentous episodes in British imperial history, most notably the loss of the American colonies then the economic collapse of the West Indies. When they first sailed to Jamaica in the 1780s, it was the most valuable possession in the empire. When they left in the 1850s, it was a neglected backwater. Moreover, through the copious correspondence they left behind, I learnt the intimate details of their lives. Richard Rum Atkinson, in particular, emerged as a brilliant but flawed man who amassed a fabled fortune as well as considerable power but would have given it up in a heartbeat for the woman he loved. It became obvious that I had stumbled upon the material for a book. Although I had edited a great many books written by other people, I had never planned to inflict one of my own on the world, being more than happy to remain on the other side of the publishing fence. But I found I couldn't ignore this story, which kept me awake at night, so I started writing at six to spend a couple of hours writing before leaving for the office. It was hard going, and on dark winter mornings it took every ounce of willpower to drag myself out of bed. I soon discovered, perhaps surprisingly, given my professional background, that I had little idea how to go about actually writing a book. So I signed up for an evening class in writing family history, and it was here that I had another stroke of luck, for the teacher turned out to be the acclaimed biographer Andrea Stewart, who was then at work on Sugar in the Blood, the story of her ancestors in Barbados, black and white. One Saturday morning, she took us on a tour of the National Archives at Kew, a vast concrete behemoth where we were inducted into the practicalities of archival research. It was time well spent, for I would become a frequent visitor over the next few years. Andrea encouraged me, at a stage when I really needed it, to pursue my own embryonic Jamaican story. I look back on this as a strange transitional period in my life. I felt like a kind of time-travelling commuter, secretly shuttling back and forth between the present day and the world of my 18th century family. It was exciting, certainly, but also emotionally challenging as I struggled to reconcile my inborn sympathy for these people, my ancestors, with their activities in Jamaica. I was never so naive as to imagine that those activities might be unconnected with slavery, but nor was I fully prepared for the degree to which they were involved. It was not a pleasant discovery. My eyes were opened too to the nature of Britain's culpability. I learnt that there were thousands of well-to-do Georgian families, like mine, whose wealth and prestige had derived from the blood, sweat and lives of enslaved Africans. Moreover, individuals from every rank of society had played their part in propping up slavery, from the royal personages who sanctioned the slave trade with West Africa in the first place, to the sailors who crewed the slave ships, even the ordinary working people who, who consumed the tainted sugar. Here in Britain, we have tended to keep this disturbing aspect of our national story at arm's length. Unlike the United States, where its divisive consequences are plain to see, slavery was not commonplace on these shores. We proudly celebrate our great abolitionists, of course, but we would rather not know too much about what they were campaigning to abolish. Sometimes, after another grim discovery in the archives, I wondered what kind of fool would knowingly implicate his own family by writing them into this shocking chapter of history. Yet my instinct told me to press on. In fact, I felt a powerful responsibility to do so. Clearly I could make no amends for my ancestors' misdeeds, but I could certainly attempt to make something positive out of what they had left behind. Thanks so much for listening, and stay well.